Okay, in this uh, podcast, we're going to take a look here at Ephesians 2, uh, 1 through 7. So, first of all, with Ephesians 2, uh, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So a couple of things about this passage. First of all, it is kind of questionable who the you are. Uh, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So um, this definitely sounds more like language that is uh, used to uh, describe Gentiles, um, this idea of being dead in transgressions and sins. Uh, but it could be, you know, that um, the way that Paul thinks about all of humanity, whether they are uh, Gentiles or Jews, uh, that before, before their time in Christ, that they are kind of dead, as it were, in their relationship to God because of transgressions and sins. So it's not very clear then exactly who the you are, but very likely whether it's just him thinking about uh, Gentiles specifically, or it is thinking about uh, all of humanity. So the uh, next uh, section here is um, and his, who did they, whoever the they are, um, which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. So again, this sounds uh, like language that uh, is used of, of Gentiles, oftentimes by Jews, following the ways of this world. Um, they, uh, the they, uh, seems to be the way in which Paul wants to mark off uh, Gentiles as being in one kind of state before they uh, entered into Christ. So this uh, present age the, and the ways of this world, uh, the ways of this world or the ways of this present age, so basically within a kind of a Jewish framework, of time. There is the present age and then there is the age to come. And so what Paul is talking about is how they followed in this present age uh, certain um, powers, certain forces that, that are at work in the world. And these forces are not going to be at work in the world in the age to come. But they are currently in the present age. So the ruler of the kingdom or the power of the air uh, maybe he might have in mind Satan. Maybe he may have in mind some other principalities. But, but this is this is language that describes uh, spiritual beings. It is not uh, language to describe, in particular, um, you know, kingdoms. So, by the word ruler, uh, Paul is not thinking about. The emperor, the emperor, the Roman emperor may be a person who is um, on the side of the satanic powers or the evil forces, but uh, he is not the uh, kingdom of the air. This is instead something that's going on. So um, Wright thinks this is maybe a way of referring to, to Satan, but uh, the air is oftentimes thought of as the as the place or the 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 atmosphere, it is the domain where spiritual beings exist. So, uh, and 2b says that um, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, so this other spirit, this demonic spirit, satanic spirit, whatever, uh, uh, they are at work in those. So, uh, Paul is not really saying that uh, individuals are demon-possessed. The way in which we might sometimes think of demon possessions today, but he is thinking that there is this spirit that is at work 
trying to influence people to behave in ways that are in disobedience to, to God. And so the believers used to live in, in that kind of world, and they were under the influence of that spirit. Then in verses 4 through 7, but because of his great love for us, um, God has made us alive. So first, first of all, he has this kind of you language. You were like this. Now he's got this us language, and so he kind of includes not only the Gentiles, but all uh, believers. All believers uh, have experienced this thing. All believers are made alive in Christ, um, and uh, all believers, in a sense, were dead in transgression. So really, even if the you earlier on was just to Gentiles, Paul thinks all believers have this uh, change of experience. What has happened is that believers have been made alive and they've been rich by God's mercy, his kindness, his grace uh, in Christ Jesus. So something has happened uh, to those who have become uh, believers. Uh, verse 8 is really an important passage, so let's look at uh, uh, verse 8 more closely. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Uh, not by work, so that uh, no one can boast. Verse 9, uh, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Big question oftentimes is uh, what this language is uh, talking about. So this idea of being saved. So in, in one sense, you have been saved. It's uh, salvation for Paul. And uh, another language that Paul uses quite frequently, uh, justification. Um, what all this has to do is about making an individual stand in a certain relationship with, with God as far as it relates to the covenant of Abraham. So a person is saved from, you know, in this particular case, they're saved from the spirit um, that produces disobedience or work disobedience. Uh, they're saved from the ruler of uh, the kingdom of the air. They're, they can be saved from them, uh, but then they are brought into this relationship of being children of Abraham uh, and made right. So this idea of being justified, being made right in their relationship to the covenant uh, that God has made with Abraham and to make his descendants or the children of Abraham um, the uh, people through whom he works, he's at work in the world. And so this idea of being saved, these experiences, salvation is not just something that occurs in the future. It is something that occurs now. And justification is both a thing that occurs currently in our relationship to the covenant and becomes completed, as it were, uh, when the age to come arrives. Uh, so for right justification then is being marked uh, as a member of God's uh, member of God's family. So when you are justified, you are made uh, made right in relationship uh, to God. So of course in verse eight, this what is meant by the this? This is not from yourselves. Uh, what is the gift of God in verse eight? So. Uh, for some theologians, uh, the, uh, the this can be understood as salvation, um, or it could be understood as the idea of faith. So you, are sa you have been saved through faith. So if the this in verse 8 refers to the faith, then this faith is not from yourself. This faith is a gift from God. And so that aligns more to the idea that God gives faith to individuals. They're not capable of generating faith. So it has to be given to them. But others see that what the this uh, refers to is, and the it is the salvation. Uh, salvation is not from yourself. This being saved is not from yourself. This being saved is the gift of God that one receives when they exercise their faith. So we basically have two different views of what Paul is referring to. So in my own view, 
Um, uh, I kind of align with those that think that what Paul is, is saying is that salvation is not from yourself. Um, salvation is the gift of God. So in verse 10, um, Paul talks about works. It's not by works that one is saved. Um, it is not by, by works that this come about so that no one can boast. But what does he mean by, by works? Well, in Romans and in Galatians, when Paul talks about works, he's talking about works of the law. And uh, here, this may be as well what Paul is talking about, that a person, not, it's not by works of law, as going to be illustrated in the next section with circumcision, not works of law that brings a person uh, into a saved relationship, um, but it is by faith in the work of Christ. It is what Christ has done. Um, it is faith in God working in Christ that one is saved. And uh, by good works, now here's different. Uh, the good works is not just works of law. This is good behavior, good deeds, so that we are supposed to live in a way that is in light with God's will for, for humanity, will for, for his people. So we do things, um, and so we have been saved, not so that we can just live for ourselves, but we've been saved so that we might do the good things that God desires. Uh, the, so by works, Paul then means specific laws that identify one as, as Israel. And so uh, that's what he means by works of the law. So what does Paul mean when he says we are God's handiwork? It's kind of like God's masterpiece. Um, God has a general plan for your life. It's not that God, uh, you know, has, um, you know, wants you to be a specific career and marry a specific person and have a specific number of children and live in a specific place. But God desires that human beings live out, as it were, uh, this image of Christ, this authority of Christ, this sovereignty of Christ in their lives. And so by doing that, they are this handiwork of God. God is molding them, shaping them, so that they reflect the sovereignty of Christ in their lives. Whatever it is that they choose to do, whatever careers, whatever you know, domestic situation that they uh, decide upon, Whatever they're doing, it is reflecting the sovereignty of Christ, and that's how they are this handiwork or this masterpiece of God. All right, we're now in the move to verses 11 through 16. So therefore, um, uh, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of, um, out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So uh, in these verses then uh, for Paul, uh, before becoming believers in Christ, the Gentiles believers were, were uh, separated. Um, they were without hope. Um, they were without God. Um, they didn't have citizenship uh, in Israel, and so they were uh, separated from God. Um, so uh, they were called uncircumcised. Now, uh, we don't uh, really have evidence, I don't believe, that of any Jew going around calling Gentiles uncircumcised. But, you know, by this, what Paul is saying is Jews recognize Gentiles as um, not part of the covenant people of God. Um, and so even if they were, happened to be physically circumcised, uh, that still wouldn't make them part of the covenant people of God. If people who are circumcised in compliance with the requirement to mark oneself uh, as a uh, member of that covenant, well, especially for, for men, how they would mark them, themselves as that belonging to that group. 
So it's doubtful that they were ever went around being called uncircumcised. That wouldn't be a pejorative idea at all to a Gentile. But as far as Jews are concerned, in their minds, um, a Gentile is uncircumcised. They are outside of that covenant. Uh, separated from Christ, as I said, excluded from citizenship in, in Israel. Foreigners to the covenant of the promise. So these all describe their condition prior before coming to Christ, without hope and without God. Uh, but Gentiles have then now been brought near to God by Christ's death and resurrection. So this kind of spatial language that, you know, here is God in this one place, and so you've now been brought into this location, as it were, closer to God. And of course, um, you know, people outside of Christ are not, um, have, don't have this uh, access to God in the way that believers have access to God and to the divine life that's made possible because the fullness of the deity, as we learn in the book of Colossians, the dwells in Christ and those who are in Christ uh, participate in that uh, divine life. So we have access, we have been brought near to that to God and that divine life. Um, so let's go on and then into verse um, uh, 17. So he came and preached peace to those who were uh, far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. So Christ came and preached peace to those who were far away from God, that is Gentiles, and those who were near to God, that is uh, Jews. Uh, Jews and Gentiles then have been, uh, both have the same access to God through Jesus Christ by the one spirit. So in some way, this is kind of Trinitarian type language, um, but you know, it's still not yet really Trinity as becomes developed in, you know, in the later Christian uh, creeds. Um, but it is this idea of this close relationship, working relationship of God's spirit and uh, of Jesus Christ playing some role in having people have access to, to God the Father and to his divine life. Uh, the change identity of Gentile believers is that they are now uh, fellow citizens of God's kingdom with God, God's people, and they are member of God's house, um, members of this household. So this is really kind of temple language uh, that Paul now decides to use uh, for Gentile believers. And we're going to finish up this look at Ephesians 2 how by looking at verses 20 through 22. So um, this um, house they've been built, they've been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, which Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So several of the last points here to make is this God's house, which is the church, then is being built upon the apostles and prophets. I'm not quite sure who it is that Paul is referring to. Maybe uh, he has in mind uh, the apostles of the apostles uh, that were chosen by Jesus. But Paul also understands, as we see later on in, in Ephesians 4, that there are lots of apostles, not just the 12 or 13. Um, but the church has been served by apostles and by prophets. So these Christian, Christian apostles, Christian prophets have been uh, key, instrumental, uh, foundational in spreading the gospel and helping people to understand the gospel. And it's likely that that's who he has in mind, not the apostles of Jesus and the prophets of the Old Testament, but Christian apostles um, generally and Christian prophets in general. Jesus told Peter uh, that his church would be built upon a rock, but um, maybe Jesus wasn't referring to Peter, um, but more likely maybe G Peter's confession. So we have this idea of a foundation built, but it's not really connected here to the idea that we find in Matthew 16, 18. So Christ Jesus is the cornerstone of the, of the church. There's a little bit of of discussion about and scholarship about what is meant by cornerstone. 
And uh, but I think the basic idea is that here is this uh, one stone that is laid that kind of makes sure that everything else is kind of in line. It sets the direction of the of the building. Uh, Paul is echoing at least here Psalm 118 verse 22, uh, which was used by other uh, writers, Christian writers, to identify Jesus as the rejected stone that becomes the cornerstone. And you can see there are several places where this concept of Jesus as a cornerstone is found. Uh, again, here the church uh, is in, in Christ is a holy temple, uh, and so in which God dwells by His Spirit. So this temple language again, and again we have this kind of Trinitarian language. So the church is this place where God is living with his people, and he's living with them uh, by means of the Spirit, but we are living, God's living with us because we, we exist, have our existence in Christ Jesus, who exists in the heavenly realms. And so that ends our look here. A quick look at Ephesians chapter 2.